Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to introduce myself and our panelists discussing the best practices, tips, and tools on how you can solve the contact center puzzle in your organization. My name is Lori Miller and I am in marketing at CASC. We're here today with Mark Smiley, a principal advisor of customer service management at CASC. With over 15 years of operational and consulting experience, Mark works closely with clients to enhance their support organizations capabilities to provide world-class customer service in an eff efficient and empowering way. And also Matt Walton, our principal consultant at CASC. Uh, Matt's a global information technology leader who has worked various roles within the space over the last uh, 17 years. Very quickly about CASC, we're by far ServiceNow's number one business transformation partner. What does that mean? We help clients understand and receive, understand and receive the return on the investment and value that they're looking for when they begin the, customer, uh, the ServiceNow journey. Um, and without further ado, Mark and Matt, take it away. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, Matt and I are super happy to be here. Um, and we're going to be talking about, you know, for the next, um, we're going to have this uh, conversation kind of divided into two parts here. I want to talk about the highlights of the contact center, really the key pieces that help bring it all together, um, because we feel that it's important for organizations to really understand, you know, where to start focusing, where to look to if you're starting a contact center, what, what pieces will have to come together? Or if you're already in a contact center and, and managing and operating it, uh, what areas you may you may have missed, may have not thought of as much. So <clears throat> as uh, Lori said, uh, this is myself. Uh, I'm Mark Smiley here on the left. And Matt Walton, if you want to say a quick hello. Hey, guys. Great. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, no, we're super happy uh, to have everybody here. So. Um, Let's really kind of define the, the goals of the modern contact center. Just start the conversation of, you know, wh what we agree upon is the contact center, uh, what it's about, what it's there for. And what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to provide, we are going to provide as a contact center, a consistent interaction through which customers can receive services, either with a resolution of issues or orders fulfilled in the expected timeline. So that means as a, if I'm a consumer and I'm contacting your support center, Every time I call, if I have a similar question, I expect to get a similar answer. I, should, I expect to see consistency throughout the organization. So if I'm ordering products and services, um, or if, I, if I'm seeking information about products you have, or registering a complaint, trying to get help, the people on the other side, the people I'm talking to, whether it's chatting, emailing, hitting up on social media, et cetera, I expect those, those individuals to provide me with a consistent and high level of customer service. Um, the, the contact center is there to answer questions and assist customers in selecting the right services that they require. Um, they are there also to record every interaction they have. That should be one of the core fundamentals of a contact center is when a consumer contacts me, I'm recording that information in a centralized platform. That way, not only does the, the customer know that I'm, you know, I'm registering them, uh, I'm recording the, 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 either the issue or the order, um, I can use that information for future, for metrics, and to better myself as an organization. And we're going to dive into that uh, throughout this presentation. Um, the contact center also has the ability to escalate and, and get the, the record to the right teams, the interaction to the right teams who, who may be more specialized. They should have the ability to understand, I can't help you, but I know somebody in my organization who can, and I will get you the help you need. Um, they're also one of the core fundamentals of the contact center is, of course, um, to seek the highest levels of customer satisfaction for every single interaction. That's fundamental. And what we're going to do in this presentation is look at the different pieces that help make you that best in class organization. Um, so Ruth, let's just, let's dive into it here. Um, I couldn't come up with a better name, so I apologize. But uh, for those of you who have seen Meet the Parents, you know about the Circle of Trust. Um, we are here to talk about the Contact Center Circle of Trust. And by that, I mean, here you go with our awesome graphics. We, in our collective experience as a team and my experience as a consultant, as well as doing this actually in real life, <clears throat> I want to, you know, have highlighted the key areas that we should be focusing on to build a comprehensive, cohesive, and successful contact center. So each one of these areas really in and of itself deserves hours, if not days of conversation. We're obviously not going to do that today. Uh, we're going to spend the next 25 or 30 minutes or so just touching upon these areas and hopefully planting a seed in everybody's mind about, hey, 
you know, this is something I may need to look into more uh, to better my contact center. Um, and then we're also we're going to do in the in the last 15, 20 minutes of this presentation is dive in to the platform itself that we prefer to use, uh, who we partner with, and that part that platform is called ServiceNow. Uh, we're very very proud of our partnership with ServiceNow, and Matt is going to show us how a lot of this stuff comes to life in, a, in, a, in an amazing platform. So without further ado, let's go through many of the highlights here uh, in our in our circle of trust. Uh, really, these are just think about this as like chapters in a book. Um, if, if we're going into great detail, um, this is the way how to organize it. So <clears throat> let's explore these components. So one of the first things we have is business rules is one of the, the key pieces in that circle. And if I'm managing a contact center, if I'm establishing it, or if I'm trying to better myself, one of the first things I'm gonna ask is why am I here and what do I do? What is my scope? Um, and not just thinking about it, but actually documenting it, training to it, living that that around that. Um, because I don't want to just take calls for any reason. I want to take calls in support of a mission. Um, so whenever we do consulting work, whenever I engage, or whenever I've, I've managed a contact center, one of the first things I want to do is define why I'm here. What is my mission? So um, when we go, go into that, it, it's a little bit more detail. It's, well, is this an operations manual or run book? Yes, I'm documenting who I am and what I do. And in that document, I've created a few of these in, my, in, in, in when I was doing operations and, and standing up these contact centers. It's really setting up a mission and vision statement, documenting that, working as a team with my management team to, to come up with why I'm here. Um, it's also important to understand the scope of support. What do I do when people, you know, what are my agents going to support? And sometimes even more importantly, what don't we support? Um, so I know if I get the if I get a call um, from a consumer and they're asking about a product that my team doesn't support, I won't waste 10 or 15 minutes of everybody's time trying to figure that out. I'll know exactly what I can do and what I can't do. And if I cannot do something, I'll at least know where I can send the customer to get the support they need. Um, in that runbook, in that operations manual, in my definition of why I exist, I'm going to set expectations for those who work in my organization. Um, when do we operate? What is expected of you as, as a contact center representative or a supervisor or a manager or a director? How do we achieve our mission? What is success? That is extremely important to me when, when, when we do consulting work and when I, when I did this uh, prior to becoming a consultant. I need to be able to celebrate when I achieve success and, and work towards it if I'm not there yet. But if I haven't defined it, um, it's really, it comes in, you come into work not knowing exactly who you are and what you're doing. So the first key to our puzzle um, in any organization, especially in the con consumer space, contact center space, is clearly defining your mission and really breaking, uh, creating an operations manual that breaks it up into these key parts. And this should fill up many, many pages uh, because we're, we're gonna go into detail about defining success, what are my key metrics, what am I trying to achieve, what's good, what's bad. Um, and so think about that as an organization um, and you'll be well on your way to becoming uh, extremely successful. And of course, make this document accessible to anybody and everybody who needs to see it. Next thing is uh, when, when running a contact center. Um, is really having an, a, a, an excellent relationship uh, with human resources. Because as if you've defined who you are, one of the first things you're gonna need to do, obviously, is fill the roles to make that lead to success. Um, the contact center is not a dead end position. A lot of people kind of have this misnomer that they're just there to take calls. But rather the people there who work there are in a unique situation because they're going to hear and see just about everything you do and your, your organization supports. These are very valuable people, whether they're taking the calls or the supervisors and the managers, those who support. So we wanna make sure we hire the right people. And in order to do that, working closely with their HR department is very, very critical. And by that, it's who are we trying to attract? What, what, what talent are we trying to attract in our organization? 
Um, so it's very important if you're if you're a manager or director of the contact center that you recruit the right talent by creating the right job description and reviewing that job description and updating it as needed. Um, your human resources team is there to assist you. They're there to help you hire, but they need the information of who are you looking for. Um, personally, um, I've always stated that I can teach somebody technology or operations, but it's hard to teach the personality. So we're really looking for the people who want to help, who are there because they're happy to be there, that they have the personality that, that they can take a consumer, let's say they're not so happy because they're not calling you to say, you know, hello, it's a sunny day. Um, they're there because they have an issue. And you want to find the right people who can take a, take a consumer from being angry to being happy at the end of a conversation. But how do we write that um, job description? It's around the core, write it around the core mission of your organization. Um, you also want to work very closely to design with HR um, an organizational structure that, that identifies and defines all the key roles and responsibilities. What is, if I'm a contact center agent, I should come in with a clear description of what my role is, what I'm expected to do, when I'm expected to be there, and what my goals for success are. Um, if I'm a supervisor, if I'm the manager, if I'm the VP of customer support, um, my role should be clear, my mission should be clear. And so part of that is working with HR to craft that, that verbiage. Uh, and I, I just wanna make sure that as contact centers operate, that this is what they're thinking about. Another key piece that I, I've worked on, um, both professionally and in operations as, as a consultant is, planning for the professional growth of my staff. So what is the step one? If you come in as a contact center agent and you do a great job, what's the next step for you? What's the clear path to succeed in my organization? There's nothing worse than high turnover rates. And in our, in our world in, in contact centers, um, it's inevitable. You know, There's only so many calls you could take before you say, hey, you know, I, I'm kind of burned out here. But I've also seen it where if I plan, uh, if I have a growth plan for people who do well, um, it's amazing how long they'll stay because they see the future for them. Uh, and if you think about it, again, those who work at a contact center, they see everything, they hear everything. They're going to become extremely knowledgeable, knowledgeable about your organization, the services you support. And that knowledge can be useful in so many different areas in your organization if you, if you allow them to stick around. So really plan for that. And of course, at the end of the day, define and document the goals and objectives for each employee, uh, whether it's by role or by function. So as a supervisor, what are your goals? Well, you're there to manage, it, let's say, a supervisor team of six or eight people. Um, your goal is to have them trained properly. Your goal is to make sure that you know, your employees are, are successful. Let's really develop those SMART goals, right? Whether they're, when they're measurable, attainable, um, and, and they can be clearly defined um, instead of just you know, off a whim. So very important from an HR perspective to build your organization around uh, these key objectives. Next piece of our, our puzzle in a contact center um, is, of course, you know, the physical environment. I, in many or whether you know some in many or contact centers they set up virtual contact centers. Some people may be working from home. Some people come into a centralized contact center in a, in a big office. It all applies. You want to make sure you, as a leader you understand that people are on the phone eight hours a day, um, and it's not the easiest job. And and setting up the right physical environment um, is is extremely important because they, you want people to be comfortable. You want those who work for you. Um, to not have that in the way of being able to provide great customer service. Um, you'd be surprised, uh, and, and even today, uh, I walk in and do a lot of consulting work, headsets aren't there, or they're very limited. Uh, and people are, are, are ruining their necks, just like this, this lady here is in, the, in this picture. It still happens. And it's just not, it's not done on purpose, it's just overlooked. Um, it, it, it's the physical environment, it's, it's setting people up to do their jobs eight hours a day, and be comfortable. So consider phone technology, um, make, pe make, make people's lives easier, look for those wireless Bluetooth headsets, don't chain them to their desks. Uh, if, if your contact center agents need to stand up and stretch and still provide customer service, allow them to do that. Um, 
when it comes to sitting space, um, of course, there's so many different options. But at the end of the day, consider enough space for people to be comfortable, to have just enough privacy so the person next to you um, isn't heard on the call as much as you're being, you know, you're, as you're heard on the call when you're speaking to somebody. Um, again, look at the, the the monitors, look at the space. Um, dual monitors or triple monitors are so useful for somebody working in, in a contact center because they could have, let's say if they're remoting into a cus uh, cus customer's computer, if they're doing that kind of support, um, they can have one screen dedicated for that, another screen dedicated for doing research on the issue. Um, provide enough space where there's enough serenity for people with their, if they can talk, again, they can hear the customer much clearer than they can the person next to them also providing customer support. It's the little things that matter. Uh, in my experience, just talking to those who work for me, um, seeking their advice um, and has always been more useful than me maybe hiring a consultant to come out and say, help, you know, help me design something. Um, I'd like to gather ideas from those who are actually doing the work. It's, that's been beneficial for me. But just certainly take that into, into consideration. Next thing, uh, contact center, uh, those who are leading these organizations, you know um, scheduling can be uh, always, always an issue. Um, it could be a challenge. Um, but you're there for your consumers. So when you're developing a schedule for your contact center, and, and whether it's you know you're establishing it or trying to to optimize it, um, the scheduling piece is critical. You need to be there when your consumers expect you to be there, because um, that's that's your mission. Um, and you you should be there in enough. You should have enough staff where when when consumers call, you staff correctly for the peak times. Um, for peak business during peak business hours, or whether you know maybe you you have enough, you get a, a a huge increase in calls on the weekends or holidays. That means you need to be there on weekends and holidays. If if calls die down at two in the morning, but you're a twenty four seven operation, that's when you can cut back on your scheduling. But it's it's important to number one, not guess, but take take that guessing out of it as much as possible by using metrics and training analysis to design the most accurate schedule possible. And that means you're, if you have a modern phone system, if you have a modern ticketing system, you know already when calls come in and when they don't come in. And that kind of historical data is critical for you. Um, hopefully you can pull up at least a year's worth of data so you capture the full life cycle of your organization. Obviously, if you're a contact center providing, let's just say, you know, income tax support. Uh, you probably know March and April are going to be very busy months for you, and that's when you need to staff. And maybe November, December isn't so much. But if you are a contact center providing support for, um, you know, let's say, gifts that people receive, Thanksgiving and Christmas might be the time you really need to staff. Um, so look at the metrics. Try not to guess as much as possible. Use the existing technology. Um, and, and really understand when people call and when people don't call uh, because you're there for them um, and, and building that schedule around that is going to be critical for you. Um, again, look, like I said, looking account for specific times of the year when contact volume can substantially increase just depending on your, your line of work. Um, and also just beyond pure numbers, if you have a contact center that's specialized into different departments or, or that only that focus on special products or specific products. Look and make sure you have the right mix of people at the right times. Um, if you have a call tree that says, you know, press one for this or two or three, um, it's going to route to a specific group. You want to make sure you have enough people in those groups to take the call as you need to. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating for a consumer, as you guys know, uh, than sitting on hold um, or, or you know waiting for somebody to pick up a chat or respond to an email. So schedule based on metrics, look at, make it a facts first discussion um, and, and build it around that. But certainly a key component. Next piece of the puzzle for us is channels. And by that is you as a, as a contact center really need to look at and make a decision on how will you accept inbound conversations? How will you allow consumers to contact you? Um, today's consumers um, are looking for multiple ways to be able, it's on their schedule, it's at their convenience. 
Um, we're still doing a lot of consulting work uh, to admit where the phone number is it. Uh, that if you need help, you call us and it's nine to five Monday through Friday. And those organizations are the ones that tend to suffer in, in customer satisfaction scores. Uh, many of today's consumers don't want to pick up the phone and call. Uh, but as an organization, it, it's, you need to consider as part of who you are, how you want your consumers to interact with you. Um, and on the right here, you see some examples, um, whether it's by phone or whether it's by email, chat, providing self-help or, or, or responding to social media. Each of these are extremely viable. Each of these can be, uh, uh, are very important in your strategy. Um, but know that you know the modern consumer, they're looking for other ways beyond phone. Uh, they would love to get self-help. And if you as an organization can provide that information so consumers can help themselves, then that's the best because um, that way uh, you know, they may not have to call you. And that's, that's the best part. So as you're establishing your, your organization, um, have a business plan in place to support every channel offered, right? So have a team dedicated, obviously, for the phones, but also in, ensure that uh, you're looking at emails that come in. Uh, one of the things that modern technology can do is convert an email into a, a record, a case in your in your case management platform. We could talk about that a little bit later. And having chat is also a very powerful means of communication. Um, for me personally, I'd rather not call somebody. I'd rather just chat with somebody and get it done. The, the companies I'm happiest with are the ones that can respond to me in a minute, answer my question, I'm done. Whether it's by phone, on the phone, I can open up a chat window or um, you know, on, on the computer or in, the, in that sense. Um, Self-help is a very powerful mechanism, but it takes a lot of back-end support for your, from your customer support organization to feed that self-help. You're responsible for the information that goes on the website that they're looking at or the, the support portal they're looking at. If information up there is bad, they're not going to trust you anymore in terms of what support they're getting. And they may go and find some third-party support that you don't want them to. Um, social media is also a very powerful player, right? So if I go on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and hit at your company's name, you should be aware of that. Uh, modern case management platforms today can integrate with these social media platforms. If someone hits my site and addresses it on Facebook uh, or Twitter, I can create a case off that right away and I can send an alert to my team to, to react to it. Social media, as you know, goes viral. Uh, you wanna be able to put out those fires right away. But you also, as an organization, need to plan around that. Um, staff it correctly. Train the, the, your individuals uh, on how to respond uh, the right way. If you're dead, if you're going to go phone system, invest in the right technology. Um, invest in, you know, take the time to schedule correctly so people can answer the phones right away. Uh, train them so they understand what their goals are for customer levels of customer service. Every one of these components requires those key pieces to make to make it successful. Okay, uh, so as an organization, the channel discussion is extremely important. But if you do decide to offer self help, if you do decide to react to social media, you as an organization are responsible to deliver uh, A plus service every time. Train, respond, and and focus on each of these. Okay, next key to our puzzle is capacity management. Um, as you guys know, most most organizations you're not static. My company now, let's say, has $10 million of revenue and we have 500 employees and we support three products. Well, a year from now, you may have $100 million in revenue and 2,000 employees and 10 products. Probably the contact center you have today um, won't keep up, whether it's just by pure personnel you're going to have to expand with or the physical space around you. You're not going to have enough desks. Um, so always keep an eye on the future. Uh, never be satisfied with what you've got today. So when we talk about capacity management as one of those key pieces in our circle, it's looking at personnel and it's looking at the physical space. And how do we do that? Well, it's aligning yourself to the business plan. So as a contact center director or someone at the VP level, one of the things, one of your responsibilities is not, not only just maintain what you have today, but working closely with the business 
uh, and senior leadership of the business to understand what six months from now looks like. Because anything that changes six months from now, hopefully it's on the increase, it's going to impact the way you provide customer support. And what's sufficient today probably won't be sufficient six months from now or a year from now if you're growing at 20% annually or if you're going to introduce two or three more products and services. Um, so direct impact for you as, uh, as a customer support organization. So some of the things to look at and some of the, some, some of the areas that will help drive volume for you is how quickly is your, is your business growing? Uh, what products or services is the business investing in? And really what's in the pipeline for your business? If they're going to introduce two or three more products or new products and services to your consumers, what's the support mechanism for it? Um, what information are you going to provide on your portal so they can access it if it's self-help? How will you train your staff to understand what those services are so when they call, um, you can support them right away? Um, what information you know, do you feed your agents in terms of a knowledge base? So if they don't know right away off the top of the head, they can go research it right away. All these things need to be done before, obviously, you go live or as you're, you know, you get to a tipping point. So if you're at 70, 80 percent of capacity, now is the time to start looking at the future. Where is the business going and how do I align my consumer or my customer support organization um, to, to match the growth? Uh, we don't want to hit 100 percent capacity. So looking at, again, how do we define capacity? of is how many how many contacts can each agent handle? Um, how many calls and emails and chats can one person do it a day? And if we're approaching that maximum, now's the time to make that investment. Uh, if we're looking at physical space requirements, um, there's a possibility you could do multiple shifts so people can share a desk. Uh, we can have a follow the sun model of virtual contact centers. So maybe you set up multiple contact centers. Um, or you literally just, if you're a centralized space, uh, buy more space, uh, but don't run out. Um, I've been in those, in those situations, and I really wish as a leader I, I spent more time on capacity management. Um, so I'm throwing out some tips there. Um, and the best thing we can do is get involved, talk to the people who are leading the future for your business, and understand where it's going six months from now so you can make those decisions today and early. Okay. Um, one of the things that helped make a successful contact center, one of the other key pieces, is building the right department relationships. Um, you are not a silo. Uh, you don't just come into work, somehow take calls, and go away uh, at the end of the day. Uh, there are a lot of key pieces uh, and, and departments in your organization that help make you successful. Um, so it's so important for you as a leader in a contact center to align yourself with these other departments. Here are a few of them, um, and but there's there could be there's certainly more, but these are the three that I have found um, that when I align myself with the leaders of human resources, the facilities department, or the information technology department, it helped me be a better leader and helped me prepare my staff for what's coming up uh, and, and to manage the day to day. So, from an HR perspective, we talked about this already. But ultimately, it's the people that make or break you know, the success of your, your support organization. Really work closely with HR um, to, you know, to craft the right messaging about the type of personnel needed. They're there to help you. They're, ha they're there to screen you know, candidates for you. Um, they're there to market, uh, you know, the, the advertise the positions. But you need to work with them. Um, and you need, they need their, the HR department needs your feedback. Are you giving me the right candidates? Are you, are you, are you screening the wrong ones out? Um, are you crafting the right job description so I only get the right people? It's gonna go back and forth, but having that relationship is absolutely key. From a facility standpoint, if you're in an office and your contact center is in this space, man, it helps to be friends with the facilities manager, right? If, if things break or if you need to expand, um, if you need to update some of the technology, or you know the physical space um, pan working with facilities and having that uh, solid relationship is key. Um, you want to you want to design the right space. You want to have the right seating arrangements. Um, you want to be able to let's say have you know flexible desks. Let's say the ones you know the, the Vera desks that can stand up. Working with facilities, they're the ones who are in charge of helping to order those parts and, and pieces that help put your your space together. Uh, work closely with them. Um, I found it always very very helpful. 
Uh, and again, the last uh, department, at least in the top three here, information technology, um, working closely with the IT team, especially the IT team that is in charge of the consumer facing technology, if that exists in your organization, is absolutely critical. Um, why do customers call on many occasions? And many occasions, there's something's broken. If, if you support an app or a website or a product that's online um, and that breaks, you know you're getting the calls, not the IT department. But if you work closely with the IT department, um, you, they can proactively tell you, hey, if there's gonna be an outage or some downtime, or you can give them feedback of when to take down services if it's planned or when not to. Um, from a technology standpoint, I love linking cons uh, consumer support and IT. So if there's an issue on an IT uh, uh, piece of technology that, that's customer facing, they can alert you right away. You can prepare your agents right away of what's coming. Work closely with that department. Um, you'll find yourself in a much better position to provide great customer support. Um, I believe we're almost there to, to the point we're going to get to the, the ServiceNow demo. Um, but one of the last pieces here for us is marketing. Um, just because you, you invest in the time and energy, I found in a contact center, do people know you exist? And by people, not only do I mean my consumers, um, but it's also the, the staff in my organization because they can be your best advocates as well. Um, you're putting a lot of thought and effort into building a contact center. But do your consumers know how to get to you? And how are you marketing yourself? Um, if you are selling products and services, obviously you can put your information on packaging. You can you can have uh, on your website how to get to you, uh, whether, you know, the types of support offered. Um, but make sure you focus on how I'm branding my organization, um, how I'm marketing my organization to, to the public and and internal staff in my in my company as well, because it's so important for them. So ensure that customers can find you easily. It's not a struggle. I can tell you when we do um, a, a lot of uh, consulting work, we redesign websites to ensure that customers can get to you uh, quickly and easily. Because I don't want to go through five clicks to find how I can get customer support. It's very frustrating for me as a consumer. And so we've worked with our, our clients to help them become better uh, advertisers uh, of who they are and how to reach customer support and what's available for them. Um, some of your best advocates I have found are the people that work next to me in different departments. Uh, if I'm in a large company or me, even it doesn't matter what size company, frankly, let them know you, who you are, what your department does, um, because they'll tell their friends. And, and, and it's important that if they're buying their products uh, and services, that they can be chief advocates for you and how to reach you, uh, what you're able to do for them. It just it, it helps up your brand. It helps brand loyalty. It helps your consumers know you're there for them and you got their back. Um, so think about that, the messaging around how you let your consumers know you exist and how they can reach you. Okay, so the other three key pieces from that, from that circle um, there was case management, knowledge, and, and, and metrics. Um, these three key pieces are, are very critical, and what we want to do is bring those to life. Because I've been doing a lot of talking. A lot of the, what we just spoke about is it's, it's reality, but um, what we can do here with these three, case management, knowledge management, and metrics, is bring it to life with a platform uh, that we partner with, and it's called ServiceNow. Um, case management being how to master uh, the recording of interactions with your customers, how you can record the right information and get the case to the right team so they can, the consumers can get the support they need. Uh, from a knowledge management standpoint, it's feeding your agents and it's also feeding your customers the information they need to provide support, whether it's for themselves or for your agents to provide the support for your customers. And last is metrics. As a contact center, every contact is, is should be recorded and think about the numbers and the metrics and reports you can pull. Um, so that's, that's key to make yourself better and really understand who, where you're at today. Uh, so what we want to do is pass this over to Matt. Uh, and Matt is going to bring these to life and show us what these mean in, in a world-class platform like ServiceNow. So go for it, Matt. 
And I will go ahead and share my screen with you. Actually make you presenter. Awesome, can you guys see my screen? We got it. Perfect. Well, thanks Mark and welcome everybody. <clears throat> Gonna continue our story from the last webinar that we presented on around Dishwashers Inc. Um, so let's see what this customer service management application can do for Kevin Duffy, our contact center agent for Dishwashers Inc. And first we'll look at general case management. So, <clears throat> Because Dishwasher Inc.'s contact center has been well designed with a clear vision and expectations, Kevin is not only able to provide customer support with ease, but also know when he's not the right person for the issue at hand. Equally important, Kevin, is also the, has, Kevin also has the desire to learn, improve, and knows what he needs to do in order to grow within his organization. For the, furthermore, he's been provided with the tools to help him be successful. Although Kevin and his team are relatively new to the ServiceNow platform, <clears throat> one thing they have really come to like about it, the new module being implemented, is the consistent look and feel. As discussed previously, not only is this experience important from a customer facing perspective, but also for the intern internal users. <clears throat> right now, let's focus on the platform he's been trained on in order to get issues to resolution as quickly as possible. So as the lead agent in charge, Kevin first navigates to all open customer service cases to see where his team stands. You can see that there are a number of large, <clears throat> there are a large number of tickets having various priorities with several, several related to his team. However, many of these are in a closed state. Kevin wants to get a better view so he can understand only what is under his team's ownership. In order to weed out closed cases, he decides to add a filter, which will show only cases in the state of new or open. and then he runs the filter. Well, although this filter reduced the total number of cases showing, it still didn't get Kevin to where he wanted to be as he's seeing internal company cases in addition to his dishwasher consumers issues. Thus, he decides to adjust the filter to include his assignment group, Dishwasher Inc, Dishwasher Support. And you can notice the different operators that have been used. In the first one, we wanted to get all cases that were in a state of new or open. Um, obviously, you couldn't have a case that is in both states, so you need to use the or uh, operator. And in this, this case, we're adding a condition for an and, um, <clears throat> where the assignment group is dishwasher ink. And then you rerun your filter. Awesome, this is looking a lot better. So because they set up the system <clears throat> um, with different workflows, all cases related to dishwasher models, dishwasher ink cells and services are automatically assigned to the dishwasher ink support group. Kevin now has a clear view of all cases in new or open state and can begin to prioritize his team's work. He then realizes that he could have added assignment group as a field. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and filtered immediately on that column. So here you can actually configure the different columns that you have in your view. So let's look for assignment group. We'll add it over, move it up a bit and say, okay. So as you can see, had he been at all cases and then filtered, on or sorry search for sign group or filtered he gets all the issues closed resolved new 
open, awaiting information, et cetera. Um, in addition, you could back, go back and say, um, and state is new or open. And it gets into the same location much quicker. Kevin thinks to himself how much easier the system is than the previous tool they had in place and shakes his head with a smile. Now, Kevin examines the new and open cases based on priority and sees that a couple new high priority cases are not assigned to anyone on his team. Thinking that perhaps they were logged during the shift change, he takes a closer look. He sees that three are from their new account with Bob's Big Belly Restaurant and knows they are a high priority for his team. He promptly goes in and assigns the first two out to his team members. In order to assign his team members, he goes through the assign to box, click search, and he's got the rest of his team there. So he's gonna assign this one to Chet Cheddarson. And then he's going to update the case brings him back to the, the case list. And you can see Chet has been assigned to this case for Bob's Big Belly and can start working on it immediately. And let's look at the second one. Ooh, dishwasher plug has the wrong fitting. That's not good. Again, we'll go to the sign to and we'll do a search. Alternatively, he could have just typed in Billy's name and it'll bring him up. Again, he updates the case and he moves on. Now we'll explore a bit more about how knowledge management and core functionality can be advantageous for use within case management. Upon opening the third case relating to Bob's big belly, Kevin recalls a similar case, but can't remember which one. So let's see here. Here is the last case. <clears throat> he sees it's currently in a low priority, which he doesn't like, uh, as he knows it's a new customer. But Kevin first scrolls down to check on the current SLA. So it's at a case priority, three to four priority resolution of up to five days. Um, this is not acceptable uh, based on the account's new status and he immediately upgrades the priority to critical assigns himself the case which he could either do by typing his name here or hitting this button up here assigned to me and now you can see kevin is populated as the assignee and he saves the case He decides that later on, he'll most likely create a special handling note on the account to handle the fact that it's new and should be in a higher priority. So upon opening those cases, his agents can see that um, it should be escalated to a higher priority immediately. So Kevin scrolls down again and makes sure that the SLK, SLA has been upgraded. So you can see that the first one has been canceled and the second one is in a state priority one resolution of eight hours, and it's currently in progress. So this is exactly what he's looking for. Additionally, he's got the advantage of looking at the related links section. He remembers that the CSM platform has the ability to search for related cases when a new case is logged. So at the bottom of the case, Kevin clicked on the related cases tab and five of them came up. As he's looking through the, the short descriptions, <clears throat> the last one is most relevant to the short description here. Um, the customer's hearing a clanking around, noise, uh, there's dirty water sitting in the bottom of the dishwasher, and apparently they got it all over themselves. That's not good. So he looks again and loud noises during any cycle and water is remaining in the basin. So he clicks into that case.
as he reads through the case, he realizes that it's actually his wife, Jennifer, um, newly married. And he, he scrolls down and to see if there's any knowledge articles attached, which there are. So he clicks on that tab. He then opens that record and clearly remembers <clears throat> um, this knowledge article. It's extremely detailed, has step-by-step -step procedures for fixing the issue at hand. And since this has worked in the past, he believes that this is probably the issue for Bob's restaurant. So he goes back into the ticket. after jotting down the knowledge article number. <clears throat> and again, clicks on the knowledge button here. He's provided with a bunch of different knowledge articles. And fortunately, the one he's looking for is at the top. Yep, that's it. So he decides to attach that to the case. Add in some closure, cause and closure notes. So cause might be a clogged filter. We'll push to push answer to customer and wait for them to see if the fix works. And with that, he decides to propose the solution to Bob's restaurant. And we go back into our list. So as you can see, it's not in a state of new or open. Can't find the same one here. So he goes into his my cases list. And now we can see it. It's the bottom issue here. And you can see that it came in through a chat window originally, and it's currently sitting in a result state, which stops the clock in terms of SLAs. So it's waiting on the customer um, to either respond to an email that has been sent or for the customer to log in through the customer service portal and either accept or reject the um, information that Kevin has sent. So to make sure the note has been sent, um, Kevin will go back into the case, scrolls down, clicks on the emails tab and can see that a note has been sent to Bob at Bob's Big Belly um, with the proposed solution. Kevin is really happy with how easy it is to communicate with his customers using the new system, not to mention the ability to capture all the key information they need to help in resolving their problems. <clears throat> now we'll look into case escalation. So Kevin goes back to his queue to see what else he's got on his plate by clicking on my cases. So it looks like he's currently got five issues open, um, but he notices one that's in high state that's open um, and decides to check on that one first. He knows this case well, as you remember trying to help Danny for quite some time after he initially received the case Kevin suspects that the resolution he provided didn't work for Danny as the case is now back in a state of open and not resolved where he previously proposed a solution. Kevin opened the case and he's looking for any feedback from the customer, which would have been entered through the portal. And there it is. Um, so you can see that he previously provided, Kevin previously provided a knowledge article um, about how to check the drive motor of the dishwasher to see if it's working properly. Uh, and Danny replied, hi, Kevin, 
I tested the motor per the article you sent and watched the video you attached. I appreciate the help, but the motor is working just fine. What's the next step? So he obviously rejected <clears throat> the fix and sent it back to Kevin for further information. So the first thing Kevin does <clears throat> is look to see if there's any other knowledge articles that would work. And based on the search that he's done, none of the, the first one is the one he's already used as he clicks on it and believes that, oh, I'm not along with the video. Um, obviously did not work for Danny. So with that, Kevin decides that he's going to escalate the issue. So back in the issue, the first thing he does, he's going to assign it back up to his um, escalation group. So he starts typing in and looks for escalation team and does a search on who's available and his good friend Paul is available. So he signs the case to Paul. And furthermore, he scrolls down to the related links section and clicks escalate case. In the request source field, he selects internal and reason lack of progress. And he types in a little justification, he tried all possible fixes based on knowledge articles available. He adds himself to the watch list and he adds Paul as well. And then he submits the ticket so that it will be escalated. And you can see at the top here, it gives you a message saying that the escalation 1006 has been requested for case 1057. He closes the note, clicks update, he goes back to his issue list. And as you can see, it's no longer listed under his name because he changed the assigned to. Danny, on the other hand, will be notified via email of the escalation and can see the same via the customer service portal. Kevin then looks at <clears throat> the escalated cases list to make sure he sees the case he escalated. And it's the second issue down, Danny. And you can see a red dot next to the customer service number indicating that it's been escalated and also the escalation number itself. Lastly, just to make sure that an escalation was created, he then clicks on the all escalations button and looks for his escalation, remembering that it was 1006 looks like it was logged and he can see his escalation justification that he just typed in. He knows that his case has been escalated and is happy that Paul is taking over because he's more he's more technical and is happy that <clears throat> it will get to resolution quicker. So lastly we're going to touch on a little bit about Kevin's agent dashboard. So these were being newly created for Dishwasher Inc. and Kevin hadn't used it yet. So he pulls up his dashboard and he can see that his team's resolution, first call resolution rate is 78% and it's gone down um, 6% since June 13th, which was yesterday. And you can also see that he's got one case open He's got one case that's in a new state. He has zero cases with problems. He has his group, so his assignment group, 
has three uh, priority one cases. You can see that his group has eight cases open. And you can also see that he's got zero um, knowledge articles created. Uh, obviously, this is a to do item for Kevin. So he goes and first clicks on my open cases. What's great is he can see everything that's not in a state resolved of resolved, closed, or canceled. So instead of all the filtering and lists he was clicking on over here, he could have just clicked on this past um, screen on his agent dashboard and gotten to the same place much quicker. Furthermore, he looks at my group's open cases. And right there, he sees everything that's not in a state of closed or canceled. Um, so he'll see everything that's open, new, or resolved. Resolved is still open, again, as those are uh, situations where they pass the ticket back to the customer to see if their proposed solution would work. So officially, the case is not closed, but um, will be if the issue or the, the resolution they proposed um, is accurate. So uh, <clears throat> this is a great way for Kevin and his to see his team's um, stats very quickly, what's important to him. Um, and there's other widgets he can add to configure it more for his liking um, and really give him real time, which is what this stands for. Um, so it's updated in real time, which is fantastic and <clears throat> gives him the ability to react tactically um, very quickly to identify pain points for his team. We can also show this trending over time uh, using the ServiceNow Performance Analytics plugin. So if you'd like to see more, please get in touch. With that, I'll hand it back to Mark for some final words. Thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I know we're pretty much out of time, but um, I'll go ahead and share my screen again. One moment. Oh, great. Bring us back to where we were one second. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Matt. And again, we, we at CASC, we like to really focus on the, the strategy uh, piece uh, uh, and the consulting piece of, of work. And we also are, are experts in the implementation of the ServiceNow platform. And when we bring the two together, it really works out well for our customers because the strategy and the processes really help drive the technology. And that's how we really hit our sweet spot. So. With that, I know, Lori, we're pretty much out of time here, but I want to thank everybody for joining and taking the time to listen. And, of course, uh, to please reach out um, if we'd like to discuss our offerings further. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Mark. Thanks, uh, Mark and Matt, for uh, the great webinar. And thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us today um, uh, for solving the contact center puzzle. puzzle. Um, we hope you re received your insights uh, to help your organization succeed. And a quick reminder, we've recorded this webinar and we'll be sending it to all participants, so check your inbox. And for more information on CASC or our CSM department, um, you can check us out at cascllc.com. We hope you have a nice day. Uh, we're right at time, so um, enjoy the webinar. Thanks. Bye.